God's grace and his mercy and his love are all yours through faith in Christ Jesus. God's word for our consideration this morning is recorded in Ephesians chapters 4 and 5 and reads as follows. The Apostle Paul writes, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their heart. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that, would, that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So far, our text. Fellow believers in Christ Jesus, do you remember this ad from the 80s? An actor held up an egg and he proclaimed in a solemn voice, this is your brain. He then cracked that egg into a hot frying pan and he continued even more solemnly, this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? The purpose of the ad is pretty obvious, wasn't it? It was meant to visualize what doing drugs does to your brain. If it scrambles your brain, why would you want to dabble with drugs? Today, the Apostle Paul paints an equally shocking picture of sin. As we continue our sermon series in the New Testament book of Ephesians, we're going to receive a God's eye view of an unbeliever's mind, or we could also say a God's eye view of sin. We want to learn that sin is not something that we want to dabble with, play with, but run away from. And instead to appreciate and nurture the faith and forgiveness that is ours through Jesus. The Apostle Paul began his words of encouragement like this, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, oops, back up. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. What does the mind hooked on sin look like? Paul says, 
that it's futile in its thinking. It's darkened in its understanding, and it's ignorant. That, of course, isn't what an unbeliever would say. An unbeliever would say, I have freedom because science is my God and my body is my Lord. I do whatever feels good and I'm having so much more fun in life than you are. It wasn't surprising them when a group of atheists got together and they had this ad campaign that said, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy life. Today, the Apostle Paul corrects that misunderstanding of sin. He gives us a God's eye view. He says that sin darkens your mind and your understanding. It's like hopping into your car on a frosty winter morning, and you're late for work, so you think, I don't have time to scrape the windshield. And anyway, I know where I'm going. Ever done that? You think, well, the windshield wiper blades will take care of this, or I can just shoot some windshield wiper fluid but then you're hardly even back out of your driveway and the windscreen has frozen over again and you realize that this is a very bad idea. You cannot see what's coming. You don't know the dangers ahead. Paul describes the mind on sin in the same way, that you are darkened, you are ignorant. You don't know the true dangers that are out there, that there's a real spiritual being called Satan whose intent is to lead us to a real place called hell. Instead, the Apostle Paul says, this is the attitude that we should adopt. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by his deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. When we were brought to faith in Jesus, there was a transformation that occurred. Our old self was stripped off. And in its place, we received the new self created to be like God. For most of us, this transformation happened at our baptisms. And baptisms in the early church were a little bit different than the way that we do baptisms. Some of the baptismal fonts in the early churches looked like this. You would step down into the water and you would walk out the other side. But before you would step down into the water, you would strip off all of your clothes. Go in the water. And then when he came out on the other side, you were given a white gown to wear, reminding you that your former way of life and way of doing things, that's been stripped off. And in its place, God has given you something so much better. He's given you this robe of righteousness. You're pure, you're clean, you're forgiven. You're a child of God. It's helpful for us to think of our baptisms daily. Today we have little Evia's baptism reaffirmation and what a privilege, Jack, hey, to baptize your own daughter and, and that happened in the hospital and that's, that's cool. We wish we all could have been there but we're celebrating with you today. But now, Jack, let me ask you this question. Um, it's a little bit related. How many times a day are you changing diapers? I don't mean you personally but how many times a day does Evia need a diaper change? Yeah, a dozen times, right? Isn't that insane? It's like that's your whole life now. But that's how it should be for us as Christians. That when we step into sin, we don't just say, well, you know, that's what everyone does. It's not a big deal. Try that with Evia when she's crying because she has a dirty diaper. You know, Evia, come on, everyone has a poopy diaper from now, from time to time. Just deal with it. You wouldn't be very good parents. Likewise, we are not following through in our life as Christians when we tolerate sin. Instead, we want to strip off that sin like a dirty diaper and be reminded that in baptism, I have been cleansed. Not only that, baptism gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live as God's child. Paul goes on to give some specific examples of what that should look like. 
He said to the Ephesian Christians, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work at doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. It seems that people during Paul's day, especially the Greeks, were averse to manual labor. If they had to dig ditches, forget it. They'd actually rather just steal to make ends meet. And Paul says to those Christians, no, that's maybe how you used to do things, but if you've been stealing, you should steal no longer. Not just go find an honest job so that you can support yourself. Look at the very last phrase, so that you have something to share with those in need. The former way of life is just reflecting on one's own self and their own needs. This new life that we have in Christ looks to, well, what do other people need around me? How might we apply the seventh commandment in God's command against stealing in our situation? Well, if Paul were writing to Christians today, he might say something like this. Those who have been downloading music, movies, and games they haven't paid for should stop doing that. Those who are taking things home from work and using it for themselves should stop doing that. Of course, our comeback might be, well, everyone does those things, Paul. And he would say, sure, that's not surprising because when your mind is hooked on sin, it's darkened, it's ignorant, and it is not the way that God wants you to live. Paul makes more applications. He goes on to write, Therefore, each of you must put off, put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Paul now directs our attention to our attitude and our conversations with others. He says, speak truthfully to your neighbor. No more half-truths, no more white lies when mom or grandpa and grandma asked you, where have you been? What have you been up to? Oh, you don't lie, you just withhold important information. No more of that, says the Apostle Paul. He also says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up. No more sarcasm. No more belittling. But only that which will build others up. Paul uses an interesting word in the Greek. The word unwholesome has this picture of rotten. Picture yourself walking along a beach and a fish has washed up on the shore, it's very much dead, and you know it's been dead for a while because you smelled it before you saw it. That's what Paul's talking about here. He says, don't let any stinking breath come out of your mouths. Because when we belittle, when we are sarcastic, when we put other people down because that makes us look better, we smell just as offensive to God. He finishes this section by saying, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Have you ever worked on an art project or maybe a woodworking project? You know, you put in a lot of hours, you were really happy with the end product, and you show it to someone that you love and trust, and all they can do is nitpick and point out where you failed and how you could have done better. You grieve, don't you? You say to yourself, well, if that's the way you're going to be, I'm not going to share with you any of the other projects that I have done. Paul is saying that when we walk in the way of sin and we just shrug our shoulders, we grieve the Holy Spirit who has brought us to faith in Jesus. We are his handiwork. And if we grieve him often enough, here's the danger that he says, you don't want my ministry in your life? Fine, have it your way. 
But if we don't have the Holy Spirit, then we cannot have faith. And if we don't have faith, we do not have the benefit of forgiveness or eternal life. These are serious things that the Apostle Paul is speaking to us about this morning. And he wants us to know that we're not just to act decently towards one another, we are to react decently. He said in the next section, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I'm assuming that many of you are surrounded by fellow believers in Christ who are listening to the same sermon, and you're hoping that when you go home or you, you go off to work, that what you're going to hear from them are words that build up and not put you down. What happens, though, when they forget? What happens when they revert to their old sinful ways? Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let your righteous anger over sin morph into vengeful anger. Why not? Don't give the devil a foothold. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Instead of replaying in your mind that comment or that mean action that they took towards you, you work to let it go. Cain, the world's first murderer, failed to take to hard words like these that God spoke to him. Remember when Cain and his brother Abel brought offerings to the Lord, God was not pleased with Cain's offering, not because it was not as good as Abel's, but because Cain did not offer it in faith. He seemed to just be going through the motions of worship. Cain was angry with God. He was jealous of his brother. And yet God in his love came to Cain and said, Cain, you need to master that sin. It's crouching at your door. It wants to devour you. Cain failed to do that, didn't he? He replayed in his mind his anger towards his brother and God until it showed itself in murder. What's the alternative? forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. But if I do this, Pastor, won't I be a doormat for everyone else just to walk right over? Won't they take advantage of me and the love that I'm showing to them? That might happen. It is a sacrifice to forgive because you're letting go of your anger, you're letting go of your right to take vengeance. And yet the Apostle Paul sets for us, reminds us of the example that Jesus set, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I like the message translation of this last verse speaking about Jesus, it said he didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. This is what it means to walk in the newness of life that we have through baptism and the Holy Spirit in our lives. Not loving people only because of what we can get out of it, only because of what they will repay us with, but loving, giving ourselves to others because Christ gave himself to us. Compare that with the other way of doing things, being self-centered, worrying about who gets the biggest piece of pie. That's not a way to live. And so maybe it's not a bad idea for us to remember that ad from the 80s about drugs. It'd be interesting to see what effect that had on individuals. I remember when I saw that ad, 
I thought, wow, that's what drugs do to your brain? Then why would you want to dabble in drugs? It doesn't make any sense. That's what Paul wants you to learn today about sin. It does not make any sense. There's a better way to live through the love of Jesus. The last verse of the hymn that we sang right before the sermon said it well. And you may have been thinking to yourself, how does that hymn fit with our service? Because the readings that we heard were about the truth of God's word and the importance of speaking that truth, not changing it. What the core of the truth of God's word is his love for us and our love for others. And that third verse talked about the Spirit's work. Come, Spirit, come our hearts control. Our spirits long to be made whole. Let inward love guide every deed. By this we worship and are freed. Remember your baptism. Your old way of life was stripped off. You were giving this robe of righteousness and the Holy Spirit so that you can love just as Jesus loves you. Amen.